What's up, guys? How's it going? It's good How's to see it. Going? David, put what a up? smile on your what face. What up? Put a smile on your face. Man, I have a smile on my heart. The, uh, speaking of heart, dude, look at this, man. I walked down here to the office. Uh, Andy and the Kinetic Man, We and we happen to be in Intimacy Month. Usually, we do this exercise around... Uh, um, what is that? What is that romance holiday? The Valentine's Day. We do this challenge and we leave notes for our family, wives, whatever. And I walked down to my uh, office today and I have this little note from my daughter. Okay. It says, hello, dad. I love you. Have an awesome day. And then she folded a little heart, man. So like yeah. I'm completely unexpected and, uh, and brought a ton of joy to my heart. So there you go. Good. That, That's good. That, uh, I'll turn that frown upside down. Yeah, those are the men. Modeling, right? It's yeah, the power right. of modeling, um, and and uh, you know things stick, and and that actually unintentional segue into our conversation. I, I think uh, you know one of the things you said. Uh, I was watching some 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 stuff from your website, and one of the things that you said that really stuck with me. You said what I'm doing with vets is not a charity or a service; it's an investment. Mm -hmm. Um, and I loved that because, you know, as I look through, how do we, as business owners, how do we, as leaders, how do we, as, as, as people advocating for vets, how do we shift the narrative? How do we model the narrative and say, Hey dude, this isn't like, I'm not doing a, this isn't me doing charity for these vets. The vets don't need charity, mm -hmm. right? They need an opportunity. They need an investment. And so I love how you said that and, and completely unintentional segue, but, but the idea of modeling what that looks like as a community leader, as a business leader, uh, man, I love, I love what you're doing, dude. So. Yeah. I think, I think for me, you know, to answer your question, I think one, you, it's podcasts like this, it's conversations like this, because the, the narrative for the veteran is that we're always needing help. You know, if you look at you know, organizations that are, you know, raising money and getting donations to house homeless veterans, they they have campaign power, they have dollars that they're pushing out. And that that campaign and that narrative is, is what America shifts on. So for us, what I feel is, you know, we're we're all aligned where hey, we feel we we are in charge of our own destiny, our own transition. But the investment in the veteran is just something I believed in because we all came from different walks of life. But the opportunity for us to kind of win on the other side of the battlefield, like the the deck is actually stacked in our favor. It's just a mindset, right? And it's media, you know, likes to paint the picture that, you know, we are broken or we are beat down and there's not enough stories of organizations like yours and People like Stu, I mean, Stu just got out and he built his own transition. You guys have been working overtime, building a transition, but there's more, you know, veterans like you than there are veterans on the streets, but that's the narrative. So um, when we look at, you know, kind of the country as a whole, um, what, what I do, a lot of what I've done getting in some of these communities is really having that um, ability to you know, sit down with these cities and sit down with the mayors and sit down at the at city hall and just have these candid conversations and really explain like, hey, here here's what veterans can really do. Right. And what's what's funny is that they didn't know that, right? They 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 never heard of that. So we we how we how we do it is we change the narrative and we do it with one conversation at a time. And then we we lead by example, right? And then we never forget those that went before us, right? And we honor their sacrifice by just trying to be great in, in our plan A and then move forward with a community focus that, hey, if we can if we can support, you know, our individual effort, right? And if we can support that effort and, and add a veteran or two, right? And then be a beacon of light for those veterans coming out and we're leading them, you're not, you're not gonna have so much of a narration of the homeless veteran. Because at the end of the day, yeah, we do have homeless veterans, but we also have like 60% of veteran population is above the poverty line and they're working harder to stay there. So how do we build programs and frameworks to support that? Andy, we, uh, I, I knew we would, would do this. So we'd just like get right into it, but I want to take a little bit of a step back and, okay. and go back to like, who is Andy Williams? Kind of go back to, you know, when you started join the Marines and and then kind of moving forward from there. And and you and I go back, what was it like 16, 17, something like that is when we first met. So let's get into kind of the backstory of who you are. 
Yeah, so I mean, you know, I grew up in rural America, uh, graduated, um, had a full ride scholarship to go play football, chose the Marines. Um, my my mom was a immigrant from Barbados, my dad was a concrete foreman. You know, I'd say, you know, LMI, you know, grew up in a poor town um, and didn't have a lot of options. But what, what I appreciated was I learned, you know, work ethic, right? And that, and I used that work ethic to, to, to get ahead, right? So I joined the Marines and I worked hard in the Marines. I was in fast company. I did four years. Uh, four years was, was good for me. I was in uh, four deployed most of the time. Um, and when I decided to kind of transition out in 2003, um, I transitioned out and started working for Blackwater to fast track. And I did that for six years. So I kind of put the guns down on the military side, picked them up on the civilian side and you know, rocked that for about six years and, you know, worked hard on that project, kept my nose clean and, you know, was a silent professional. But during that time, kind of like, you know, you guys did, I, I was kind of buying up properties as a transition. When I was in the Marines, there was, I didn't really have time to even look at investments or school or anything because it was, our tempo was so high. And when I got out, um, I just, I, I figured out transition was hard. Uh, I didn't make my first transition. I actually lasted about six months before I went back to Blackwater. So I'd say I failed my first transition. Um, but I, I found comfort in the community, right? Of war fighters, comfort in the community of the war room. Um, and then, you know, I started finding out who I was to your points too. Like, eh, well, I don't know, maybe I'll be a real estate professional. Maybe I'll be a, a psychology major. I don't know. I was playing around with what I would do for several years, but what I was consistent at is just picking up properties and buying them and holding them. And it was that, um, it was really that kind of methodical approach of like, okay, I want to get out of Iraq, but if I get out of Iraq, I don't want to come back. And I don't want to be below the poverty line. I, I want to be above it, but I want to be above it with intention. And so, um, my dad was kind of in a transition for his career. I started buying up houses and we started a small business and we kind of, we worked that little mom and pop operation for several years. And then that became a comfortable kind of approach that escaped me, you know, the war. So when I get back from my runs, I just go look at my portfolio. I'd work on some leases. I'd look at some innovation or I'd buy a property, right? And so me and my dad built a bond, you know, for those six years. Unfortunately, when I came back home in 2012, I'd, I'd gotten hurt and he had uh, ended up getting diagnosed with stage four cancer. So um, life life hit me hard. I remember um, like it was yesterday because the world was so great. We, were, we, had, we me, and, me and my wife were expecting our first kid and you know, I was finally coming back home and I was taking a break. The doctor told me that, hey, you you actually can't go back because you have a huge issue with your ankle. Like you have a huge, huge issue, huge problem. So um, so the, the reality is um, I had to transition, right? I had to like look at life without a gun, look at life without, you know, ammo on my chest and a, uh, you know, call time to show up at the trucks. It, it, it was really bad. And then couple that with, all right, we got this baby coming along the way. You know, I built a storehouse. I, I had some property, I had some cash flow. And then my dad's like stage four cancer. It was, man, it was, it was crazy. Um, but yeah, I made a hard choice, right. Um, to fight cancer, which ended up creating a, a depletion of some of my assets. And it put me in a, in a very interesting kind of position but I, I made the right choice because what i learned is that you know the universe god they they bless you you're blessed with resources but they're not yours that's that's the, the lesson i learned they're not they're not mine i'm i get to use them from time to time but they're not mine and over my career i've learned is that you know just recently happened right you know the the world trusts you and the universe blesses you and then God positions you, but you got to, you got to know how to steer it, right? You got to know how to guide it. Um, and, and my, my father taught me what hard work was, but you know, when I fought cancer with him and he, and he, uh, he passed away, we fought it for about two and a half years. He called me a couple, couple, um, a couple days before he passed. And he, he said, he don't, 
he doesn't he doesn't know why I did what he did, but he he appreciates me and he loves me. Um and and he 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 will be forever in, in my debt. So the the idea that um you know my time in Iraq, my initial portfolio was really just to give him more time with his family, um, really kind of steered a lot of my social impact approach. Alternatively, I was, you know, launching a cleaning company during that time. So here I am, I'm a battle-tested Marine coming back from Blackwater, and I'm cleaning out foreclosures. And I was having fun, but I was, you know, going back to our, our earlier conversation, I just, I always looked at this, this network of veterans, the, the aggregation of that kind of community and how do you mobilize them to monetize their skills and then put them on a path of progression, right? Not so much digression. So we were cleaning up foreclosures. That didn't work. Um, I was rehabbing some homes. I was flipping a couple homes, but um, I ended up launching a company called Marine Clean. It did really well, like extremely well. We were, we, we didn't get a contract with, um, the foreclosure clean outside. Um, we were, we were actually told we were, we were like, we had scalability cause I had the network across the country I could activate, but um, it was Cypress at the time they had a contract with Chase. They said, well, we can't create a super vendor. Right. And you're not that big. So this isn't like a venture. So you just have to start small. And I was like, well, if you're not going to give me a, a regional or large enough contract that I can go build something, then I'm going to just move on. And so I did. And I was driving around, had about 12 veterans at the time working with me. And uh, I, I was seeing all the cranes going up in Texas and we were just booming at the time. And I stopped by this this um, site where it looks like they're about to start framing up this uh, this building. And it was a Walmart uh, development. And it was, I think it was MJ Construction. And I just went to the PM Hub and said, you know, what, what are you guys building? And, and then the question was like, who cleans that? Because I just thought, okay, well, if I can clean houses, I can clean buildings. And they basically said, yeah, well, you can just bid on the lineup for a final clean. And I re realized and I researched it, I was getting about 20 cents a square foot for cleaning them. And uh, so I had a small little fire team. I went and uh, when I first got my first contract, I was going to find my labor force. So I would go to like the chases uh, at night, people cleaning them. I would go knock on the window and say, hey, I got a project. And I built me a little fire team. I had got this. El Salvadorian lady who she could swell her team from two to 20. And we just, we built a, we built a nice little book together. And um, the way Marine Clean worked, it was putting veterans and leadership pros and having these small balanced businesses kind of execution force. And we ended up growing it. Um, we got in with Airmark, got in with SMU. We built a good little pipeline, but again, I, I learned a lesson, right? I, I had a veteran that was a partner, um, He's a good, good friend of mine, really like a mentor. Um, and he, when I got the company, just over half a million, he wanted to come in and help out, gave him some, gave him some equity. And uh, he kind of was running the, the business, uh, leveraged some relationships, but he ended up stealing my business from me. Right. And, and he, uh, like I had an accountant, I had a, had a kind of a small little makeshift board. Um, but I was like, you know, I was what, what happened was we 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 got it to where it was scalable, right? I just cared about the veterans. So I was like, hey, you know, um, just keep the veterans in this kind of PM line and let them kind of work. What would happen is we would work the veterans on these projects as leaders. They would manage the crews. And then by the time they're done with the development, usually EMJ Construction or Rogers O'Brien would hire them. And because they get some face time with the PMs and obviously you get them a certification, they can go in and do the job. Um, Mike had... Uh, fired one of the marines that was on my team andy real quick real quick i don't mean to interrupt you. real quick the uh, one thing that's striking me is it, as you're talking about these guys where did the i think it's i think it's an important lesson i don't want to lose it but mm -hmm. you, you're taking vets and you you said something about organizationally it almost reminded me of like a platoon mm -hmm. like you set up a platoon but instead of firing bullets at uh bad guys you are uh, you know, in pants, we're, we're dousing walking. dirty spots with Clorox, right? Like you're like getting after the cleaning. And so I, I want to, I, I want, if you don't mind talking a little bit about that, about the idea that, um, the idea that vets are not just, they're, they're not, it's not simply just a, well, if you, if you're, if you're a Marine, then you go do a Blackwater thing, you go do some contracting, you go fight because you're a fighter. No, like you can take the same 
training, significant training skill sets, and you can apply that in different places. And I think I think more people, especially in the civilian world, need to understand what you're getting with a vet. Excuse me, what you're getting with a vet is not just a trigger pulling marine, you know, devil dog. You're getting somebody who has been trained in in how to how to run, how to be a part of a small team. Mm -hmm. how to run a small team, how to exercise leadership to get an objective. That objective doesn't have to be, it just happened that that, that was defined by the Marine Corps or mm -hmm. the government or whomever, right? But it doesn't have to be that. Yeah. The skill set yeah. inherent in execution of a mission is still a lesson that is is learned and practiced and practiced hardcore. So back to your point, like that's a great investment. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, to, to just carry that on. It's like, yeah, veterans, veterans have, have really their master project managers, right? Like whether it's a small, whether it's, you know, in the Marine Corps, when you first get in, you're having to do field day, right? Marine clean, literally, that's how I like, hey, well, I can just field day these buildings, right? My theory was I'm not going to hire the veterans to clean. I would rather hire them to manage because somebody else can do the work more efficient, right? you know, be an asset light organization, but you put the veterans in leadership roles. So when I see, you know, my, my team of um, shooters, you know, fast roping down in, in Africa, when we stood up Camp Luminaire, right. I, that, that same team could have landed the, in an LZ zone and walked off with briefcases and pins and pads and, and went into the embassy and sat and talk, talked diplomacy. Right. It's just we, that wasn't our mission, right? So when I look at veterans, I look at us as, you know, we are America's fighting force, but the war in in in, in this sector and in, in the business market is market share. So how do we collectively take market share, right? Well, if we can build teams to be leaner, more efficient, to move faster, to be, you know, I had I had a billionaire tell me this once. He says, you know, I like you, right? But I want I want to I want to say this fact so you understand. It doesn't matter that you're a veteran. Is is are you priced right? Can you uh, execute at at the timeline we need? And if you can, if you're priced right and you can execute, then that that third thing, you being a veteran, that that'll make it that'll make it move. And most veterans think, oh, I'm a veteran, and that matters. It doesn't, right? Can you execute, right? Can you can you like Min Stubin, you know? going back and forth three aborters for years, but he's watched how I've executed, right? The execution is what matters, right? Execution is everything. Price is really the market, right? So when we, when I brought these veterans in and I was working with them, I, I wanted to know what their goals are, right? I wanted to know where they wanted to go. Yeah, today you're going to clean out uh, uh, a foreclosure or it's going to be sitting on a project, cleaning out a stadium, Right. But you're managing a team. Right. So that skill set is going to get you FaceTime with other organizations. But but I never really, you know, not have them understand that their skills are, are leveraged because we have more training. If you look at the landscape of the education market, which I'm now in, you have all these people with degrees, but no training, no experience. Right. Employers want experience and veterans, you know, have to do a better, a better job of really explaining what their skills are, right? The marketplace, you know, does a good job of saying we're valuable, but they really, they really try to, you know, make it as if we're a DEI case, right? Um, it, it, we really are the better, the better hire because we have the better experience. We have been tried in environments that are very hard to mimic in the civilian world. You know, even if you're just moving ammo from one base to another, or you're managing chow, or you're doing logistics, or if you're going out there making combat runs, right? You are having to be a reliable part of a bigger mission, right? And then veterans are mission-minded, right? That's why I think a lot of nonprofits have stood up when we got back from the war. And, you know, I call them t-shirt companies. They, they didn't really build infrastructure right you know they kind of alienated the american legion they alienated a lot of the the vfws who were there really building policy building community and they they made it cool and and they created programs but when you look at it now we're still having the same problems right i mean i just one of my friends you know 
40 something years old, just took his life, you know, two weeks ago, right? My last post on Instagram, I just like, man, I'm so sick of it. I'm so sick of getting the calls, getting the texts, getting the emails. And it's because the veterans are looking for a new mission. And they're also, right, let's be honest, they're trying to make sense of the mission they came off of, right? If you spend the lion's share of your time fighting a war in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and you can't, you know, be in your glory days and have these stories with your grandchildren and be proud of that, right? That's such a such a struggle, right? To to find that void, right? So America, like America, has a duty to to give us a free enterprise, to give us opportunity to be in the market, and I just think if 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 we remain um, with that theme that the American dream is available to everyone, then veterans just got to wake up and realize they got to go take theirs, right? The American dream isn't the same. You guys are living it. You guys are both served and Stu, you're now out and you're, you're appreciating the dream, right? No, but nobody made it easy for you, right? There's mistakes, right? This is reality, but, but being a veteran gives you a competitive advantage in organizations with, with this new shift in, you know, AI and, you know, the collapsing of, the, the, the middle manager and the kind of remote working and the row approach. Yeah. Veterans are going to thrive, but they got to realize that, you know, it is, it is a combative environment right now to be in the workforce because what you're really not understanding is that you're a, you're a spoke on a wheel and you, you are really there to drive revenue or value. And, and if you understood that, you wouldn't really work your resume five or six times. You would really just find an organization that wants that. And that's what organizations are, are, are taking on. Um, and then the entrepreneurs, like, you know, we're all entrepreneurs. You know, you you have to understand, you know, when you look to build a build a, a, a company or an organization, like, who do you want to hire? I just want to, I want to empower the veterans, right? And I want to create more of me in the marketplace and, and gain network effect because at the end of the day, I'm a social entrepreneur at core, right? So I look at the problem. Like we have so many problems in America, right? And everyone is addressing um, those problems with the biggest passion they have. But I, me, I just focused on two. Why are there so many veterans that are not transitioning successfully? And why is there so many ugly houses and, and distressed neighborhoods that, that represent a war zone? So, you know, I, I said, okay, well, I've rehabbed a little over 150 houses. I built a little over 200 houses. My last deal, they say you're only as good as your last deal, right? My last deal was a land development, 173 acres. We laid it out, bought it from HUD, and we executed. The team on that, on that development was, you know, much different than the team on my my home builds and rehabs, right? But then when you look at the team, you know, when you start a business, it, what I've realized is that in business, you're only as good as your team. Right. And the problem is what drove me to focus on, you know, trying to address the problem with a viable solution. That If you enter the market, you'll be rewarded. I believe that's the American dream. If you if you find a big enough problem, then you will be rewarded based on the size of the problem. So if you're solving a problem and you're on my payroll, then you're getting paid to solve that problem and your profits will probably be you know, in relation to the, to, to what, what you're addressing. Same thing in business. If you want to solve a small problem, most someone's yard, you're going to get paid, you know, for that at, at that rate and that scale. Right. But if you go take a pain point, like I play within pain points. So veteran transitioning and housing revitalization and community redevelopment, those are pain points for America right now. So I, I'm at the center of those pain points in, in working on addressing solutions that actually can make a lot of sense, that can um, build a lot of value. Um, and in doing so, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm kind of activating the mindset of a lot of veterans and helping them realize, like, what I've already did, you could do, right? And and honestly, you know, when I came up with Rehab Warriors, I was like, you know, I was doing the show and... I was like, man, we were like, we opened and shut 10 houses in like six months and it was fun and it was great. And I had one contractor, I had one assistant, I was an agent broker, finding the property, selling the properties. But I ran so many veterans that were just like, oh, I don't know how to do this, I'm going to do this. And then when the show aired, all these veterans came out and said, hey, teach me. And I was like, well, I don't want to teach you. I just want you to do it. I want to be on the finance side. And I remember if you guys look, I was like partnered with like Forvest. I went to them, convinced them, hey, we'd get like $50 million. 
I think you can put out to the veteran community. And it was like, okay, we'll we'll see if anything happens. We I think we were originally like 15 million, right? But I was just trying to really finance the veterans, right? Just like, hey, go out and do what I did. And then I started realizing the veterans that were coming to my pipeline, I was spending all my time training them because they didn't know what to do. Then I looked for all the training programs and realized that none of them was teaching that. And then I said, okay, why isn't America teaching people to be builders and developers? That was a good question when there's an opportunity to be a builder and developer. So I, I literally called every trade school in the country and ended up reaching out to NCCER, who's the National Center of Accreditation for all trade schools in the country. I got a board meeting with them. And I just asked them a simple question, like, why, why aren't you guys teaching people to be home builders? And they said, we hate home builders. I was like, why? You hate them? I was like, yeah, because they don't, they don't train. So we train skills. We're, they're more backed by um, KBR and Chevron. So they, they do industrial training. And so all the real trade schools were actually more industrial grade training. Welders, you know, pipe fitters, um, carpenters. They're, they're for industrial sites. Home builders benefit from the labor force, but they actually don't reinvest. And I started doing my research, which made me go reach out to National Association of Home Builders. And I realized, yeah, they really don't reinvest in workforce training. And when the market dies up, they stop building. And you have to build and train when the market's good or bad. That's how you build pipeline and maintain it. Marine Corps trains whether we're in war or not. We recruit whether we're in war or not. You have to maintain capacity. So what I, what I learned at the intersection of kind of the problem of housing is that we had a workforce development problem. And also everyone was trying to throw people in trades. Two belt nation, right? So I, I was, you know, very focused on not making sure veterans weren't picking up tools. Uh, and they were, they were, you know, focused on the project manager side. And, you know, I worked with DOL to get that a program approved, then went to Texas Workforce Commission, um, got it accredited and approved as an eligible training provider, operated it for a couple of years, and then the VA approved it. Uh, about last year and hey, so Andy, yeah real fast I'm, I'm just curious like as you're going through this story of, of kind of where you are with with rehab warrior and i want to take a step back just a little bit mm -hmm. where like we met you had just gotten signed and launched uh on hgtv for flipper fought fort worth right mm -hmm. and you did you did that season you talked about it a little bit hit on it did you always know that the purpose behind it all, the mission behind it all was, was this, was, was bridging this gap between veteran transition and underserved communities, workforce housing. Like, did you always have that in the back of your mind when mm -hmm. you kind of started this, this whole project of starting with HGTV and then getting in and, 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 you know, getting in with veterans and, you know, going through the workforce housing and stalking with the cities and all this stuff. Like, did you always have that in the back of your mind or has it always kind of been like just the aha moments along the way and figuring it out as you go? Yeah. You know, that's a great question. So when I did this show, the only reason why we did this show is to just do an illumination round, right? That's why we never sold anything. That's why we didn't do season two, even though they wanted to, they call back every year. We, we're, we're not interested. We just, we wanted to put it out there and just show the, show the world, that, you know, veterans can do this. We weren't a charity case. We weren't, you know, peppered with sponsors. We were just like, hey, we're out here going into our local neighborhood and buying a house, fixing it up and selling it. And to your point, you know, Stu was like, yeah, I was like, man, I, I initially just wanted other veterans to share that process. I just, I still rehab homes. I, I enjoy it. Taking a house apart, putting it back together, um, turning the keys over to a family you know, bridging that, that local community. And I told somebody the other day, it's like, you know, we have so many problems at, at the white house, right. At, at Capitol Hill. Right. But, but I'm going to fight the good fight at city hall. Right. I'm going to focus, I'm going to focus on my local community. And when I realized I was in two or three neighborhoods, like looking at the houses, I can operate in these neighborhoods for years, you know, and, and that the only programs that were available for veterans to learn this were like, guru courses or seminars or masterminds. And I think for me, I just wanted to kind of like do mass distribution of the information, like get it out to the market at scale and then make it, um, make it a, a program that the community can get behind, but then give veterans kind of a head start, right? 
But, you know, to your point, Stu, it was always like, I was figuring it out. I was like, all right, I went from, how I went from, you know, single family home rehabs to home builds was because some developer came into a neighborhood, Westford Village, I was rehabbing, and he bought up all these houses and he, he didn't rehab them. He had like bought like 48 houses in this neighborhood, went to the city and got the city to approve a teardown rebuild initiative that would have those workforce housing be destroyed and come up with like, you know, four or $500,000 houses that are so unaffordable for the, for the masses. And it was in this great school district and he executed. And when he executed it, it messed the model up because I now had no comps because he, he, he basically controlled the market. And what I realized is like, Oh, I'm, I'm out here buying houses and he's talking to the city. So that's how I started talking to the cities because I got in a neighborhood where I was trying to do revitalization and I was doing it on the outside. So I, I, at that same time, all by the grace of God, I got appointed to the state board of affordable housing. And um, I spent four years appointed by governor Abbott on the state board. And I got to learn like, okay, well, this is what community revitalization is. I went from looking at, you know, single family homes, rehabs to approving, you know, $40 million bond packages as a board member and looking at, you know, we, I think the last year I was on the board, we did 3 billion down payment assistance. And then I got to understand all the land bank and the trust that they had. And I just brought it right back down to the market. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Marina, I was just clearing a room here or there, trying not to get killed along the way, but it's a long hallway, right? Um, even even uh, like today, I just signed a 380 agreement with a city had come out later. But, you know, I went to the city. We've done probably about $100 million worth of development in the city. And um, currently in Fort Worth, and, you know, I went, I went to city of Fort Worth, try to do a partnership with them. They have all the framework, but they, they're not moving at the pace I need them to move. And I'm in some of their, you know, you were here, Stu's like homeless people walking by. It's very depressed. Um, I got a bunch of veterans coming in my program now. And, you know, I, I promoted or proposed that we do this revitalization effort and the city didn't, they liked my proposal. They're implementing it. They're just not doing it at scale. And, you know, for me, it's it's, a, it's just business, right? So I'm not like, I'm not personal, right? But I give you guys a TV show, you probably should give me a contract to go rebuild your neighborhoods since I've proven to do it. Uh, they didn't give me the contract. So I went to a, another community and said, hey, you know what? I want to move my headquarters, you know, from Fort Worth to here. And, you know, we've have a working relationship and I really want to work with a city that really wants to do the right thing. And since you guys have always done the right thing, you know, here, here's what I'll do in exchange. And, you know, we did a three, eight agreement. We're moving rehab warriors there. Um, you know, in exchange, I'm, I'm getting a fire station, which is cool. Like probably the coolest deal ever you did. Like I'm gonna rebuild this fire station house, uh, rebuild the fort and rehab warriors. And then, you know, veterans will come in and they'll train and, and we'll, we'll have community events and we'll, we'll have a, a place to really just, um, you know, operate with, with a higher, higher level conversation about community and then I can show that in some of the projects I've done and then continue to work with the city. So I signed that agreement. Um, yeah, yesterday and or on Friday and, but, but it, it's business. It's that, you know, I'm, I'm figuring things out. Like, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know you could do 380 agreements. Right. I didn't know what those were three years ago. Right. I didn't know what a land bank was two years ago, but I'm, I'm establishing them right now. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the problem and I'm just trying to bring solutions to the market. And then I'm, I'm, you know, I told you this to do is like, there's, there's always an ROI for business, right? Which is return on investment. What I don't, what I don't take is high ROA, which is return on aggravation, because I do feel right. I love my country. Right. And if I'm, if I'm here willing to kind of work in your kind of battle zone community, then you, you should, you know, garner the resources behind, you know, what we're trying to do if you really want to do it. Cause what I do know that I can't do it by myself. That's the other thing I learned in business for all the veterans listening. You know, you can't, you can't do it by yourself. You got to have a team because in the Marines, you know, we, we, we were, we were doing some really cool stuff, but behind the scenes, there's a team behind us. Right. You know, and any, any time you've done anything great, you've had a good team. And so for me at the intersection of these two pain points, I have to build teams around me and, you know, what I've done over the last year and a half is really just focused on the municipal partnerships. You know, I want to, I want to talk to mayors that really see the problem 
And then I, I want to, you know, point them to what I've done, right? Which I've got a pretty decent resume of executing on developments. But that team, th those, those are bigger teams that come with real resources, but it's going to cost you, right? These are, these are real dollars, right? And what I've realized, the smaller the project, the harder it is to build a team, which is where I feel that veterans can team build, right? So we're doing a house in Garland right now through our uh, rebuild the fort, and we're training about three or four veterans on it with the city. And, you know, we're got to hit drywall with it. And it's a rehab, it's a fire station, not a fire station, but it was a, a police substation. So the, the city had a police substation in the, in the community and, they wanted to convert it and rehab it and sell it to a, to a veteran. And so, so we we're doing a beautiful rehab on it. We're reconverting it and we're training some veterans on it, but you know, we're looking at, you know, lots the city have in the community so that we can do some more, some more builds. And what we realize is that, you know, when you come there trying to solve their problems, most cities want those solutions. They don't have it. Right. So that's the opportunity that we see that rehab warriors, you know, yeah, we can train you to be a home builder, rehab or developer. We can train you in real estate construction management, but we also have to, we're working now and like, all right, well, let's go build a pipeline because the veterans aren't going to go get that either. That's what I realized too. Right. Um, we had that conversation, Stu, right. You gotta, you, you, you gotta give them programmatics, right. So programmatically, like why, why do I have to go? If, if, if every, if every city is dealing with a housing crisis, why is there such a archaic way to address the solution, if we have solutions, if Austin, Texas just upzoned their lots and they are dealing with affordable housing and they are addressing it with more density, why is Fort Worth not doing the same thing when they have more lots, right? What I mean by that is like you have a 5,000 square foot lot. Today in Fort Worth, I have to build on a 5,000 square foot lot, I've only built one house. But if I were to buy that same lot in Austin, I could build three houses, right? And they did that because they don't have the density. So, you know, common sense prevails, right? So in the military, you know, we would get intel from other units that give us information, right? So it's not that the cities don't want to, they just, they never, ever, like had anyone, you know, bring that to their attention. So like with Fort Worth, we sat down and we, we've, We've given them some insights and some conversations that they're they're looking at. One thing they are, they're not doing it with us, but they are moving forward with a land bank. Because they said, if you if you don't start buying and controlling some inventory in these neighborhoods, you're not going to have affordable housing because you're not going to control it. You have to control your own affordable housing. I, I honestly think the affordable housing crisis is um, is lost. Like I don't I don't think I don't think that battle can be fought anymore. It's really about what is attainable housing, right? Attainable housing is. Can a, a good family earning a, a solid wage attain quality housing? Because you can't afford to own homes when, when the starter prices are 400000 and your income's fifty, right? So you either have to fan out or you have to be subsidized. And we're in 2024 where we're subsidizing down payments of $40,000 now. So when you look at it, you know, we all bought houses in our 20s. And the price was, you know, sub 130, right? And it was a quality home and we've appreciated it. And even though, you know, Stu, you probably kept yours, you know, or if you didn't, you sold it, but you wanted top dollar, right? Because as, as a seller, you, you're in the market, right? Um, and so when, when this happened, I had a Marine that I was working with. He's actually in my program rehabbing a house, but then he needed to buy his own home. He was a lieutenant. And I literally couldn't find him a home. It was about 2020. It was like crazy. So I had this rental that I've had for years. It was in an area that was okay. And I said, all right, I'll rehab it and I'll sell it to you. And I, I, I bought it for like 130, held it for 15, 16 years. And it appraised it like 250. And I was like, happy. Okay. Make, make, got some money out. You got your VA loan. You're in it. He called me back two years later saying, hey, I'm ready to sell. Can you help me find another veteran? And I was like, yeah. And, and we got another veteran in the house, put on the market. The house appraised for three fifty, and he sold it. And now that house is worth four hundred, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I, I for me, I'm like I, I held the property for twenty years, only got hundred grand in equity. This guy picked up hundred grand in equity, 
in two years, right? And the guy's only a year and a half in, he's getting 50. So on one side, if you if you listened and bought America, when we were saying go buy America, go buy houses, you're, you're, you're on the winning side. But if you were not active and you didn't execute, then, you know, housing is kind of, it's tough right now, right? Getting in. But so we moved into like, how do we create these private public partnerships? How do we leverage community revitalization? And then really be intentional about this workforce development side we're building. I don't know if that answers your questions too, but yeah. Yeah. No, that's good, man. Well, let's, um, with the time we have left, let's, let's dive into what actually Rehab Warriors is, um, what you've created, what you've built and how, how these veterans can start to go learn this stuff. Right. And then take action on it and then go get jobs, you know, after doing it. Can you explain what Rehab Warriors is all about? Yeah. Re Rehab Warriors is a, uh, it's an apprenticeship training program. So we are on the pathway to career school. We do have that academy open, but what more veterans are interested in is the apprenticeship program. And the reason is the VA, because we've done the hard work, it, it pays for the program costs. So the program cost is covered by the VA. And in addition to that, the veterans get a housing allowance while they're going through our training. So it's 300 hours of kind of education. And then we built that out and it goes over the principles and fundamentals of you know, real estate project management. And then after you do your kind of seven weeks of education, you do a one week residency here in, in Fort Worth. And it's kind of like mass exposure, right? You're, you're going to do a development day where you're going to see, you know, right now we're working on a 400 unit build a rent neighborhood, $50 million project that um, one of the engineers on our advisory team is uh, doing the lot development on. So you'll see, you know, just projects from early stage <clears throat> to um, a tax credit uh, portable housing project being delivered. And then what we do is we, we really dissect like the roads and, and the responsibilities and the people that are on those projects because real estate is such a um, interesting kind of program where you have like, you know, 20 to 30 different verticals you can go into. Um, after we do that kind of, you know, residency week, we're also kind of getting you ready for your OJT, which is the on the job training where we match you with an employer partner. And then you literally for six months to a year, you're on the job learning fundamentals in this. Uh, you're maintaining your housing allowance. You're getting the training and the experience needed. Um, and, and the goal is to really like kind of, you know, build this pipeline of real estate project managers because that is one, one of the higher income fields you can get into. Two, there's a shortage, right? Whether you're you know, project manager, project engineer, you know, superintendent, site supervisor, whatever, they're all the same, right? But the construction industry is is where I believe opportunity is, and it's kind of AI resistant. AI is going to step in, right? But it's going to really get behind you. Instead of, you know, me running a project, I'm going to have me with some tools and some and some and some support, right? So you're never going to get rid of the project manager, that physical person. So that's our first occupation that we, we, we push through. And right now we're just, you know, we're, we're, we, we're attracting a lot of veterans and the program has a limitation that, you know, if you, if you want to go through the, the program cost being funded by the VA, it is for veterans that are uh, VRNE approved, which is vocational rehabilitation and employment. And the reason why we went that path was to really build out the, the, the framework, but also build our employer partners and um, really understand kind of that that demographic, right? How do how do we really get that um, that disabled veteran that that is disabled, employable, but he might have um, a skill that needs to translate? And then we're working hard this next year is really just working hard advocating with the employers and really understanding what they need. Um, unlike traditional universities and schools where they hey take the certification, take this class, and then good luck on the back end here's your career, career advisor and, you know, hope you get a job. We're real intentional about building that, that bridge between, you know, your training and your employment and then that, that employment that can last. Right. So we're, we're spending a lot of time, you know, talking with employers and really understanding what they need and what they love about our program is that we're giving them trained veterans. Right. But also, you know, to your guys earlier point, we're giving them veterans that actually have the ability to convert their skills effectively in the marketplace, right? And and add value to that employer. And then they get a couple of certifications, one from Rehab Warriors, which is DOL, and they get a PMI certification when they're doing the on the job learning. So it's a cool program. Uh worked uh three and a half years building it out. Um 
uh, it was very intentional to give it the framework. Um, we we've kind of, you know, it's kind of like building a building a ship. We we had to build a ship within the standard standardized training. So you're getting what you need so that it can be, you know, in a regulatory body of education. But you know, you are getting real experience and real exposure, which I think you know is what veterans need, right? We just yeah. We need to come out and realize that hey, what what can I do, right? And and not put them in a box or or put them in a in a hallway that doesn't have doors they can open up and shut and just peek around, explore. Well, to your point, you know, you said that, and, and we were talking when I was in your office uh, this summer. You know, we were talking about like the GI Bill or mm -hmm. like tuition assistance and all these things that all these great programs that that military veterans have. But at the end of that. All you have is a degree. All you have is a certification. Mm -hmm. And then you got to go figure it out on your own, right? You got to go, you got to go find that job. And what I think is really cool about this program that, that you've started is no, you, you get the training, you, you get the education, but then you can walk right in to an employer that we've partnered with and get a job. That's, yeah. which, that's, the, that's like, that's what we're all looking for anyways, right? Like that's, we want, we want to get a job, not the certification, like, okay, but but that's the point is to get people in jobs. And that's what really is just really bridging the gap there. And I, and I love that piece to it. Yeah. And it's fun because what, what employers are, they're getting a different side. I'm coming to them not saying, Hey, I'm a, I'm a be a staffing company and I'm a, I'm a hire the veteran at this rate and I'm gonna take part of their salary and, and send them over there. And I'm gonna give them this little boot camp that they're there. No, I'm like, Hey, we're going to work together because employers want the veterans. Right. But they also yeah. want them in jobs that are there. So we're very intentional about, working with employers to get them jobs, but also it's like, I believe veterans should have those jobs, right? I mean, I believe that if, if a veteran, if a veteran is properly trained, he will do a job, right? And a job in, in, in this market, you know, we all are entrepreneurs, we talk about entrepreneurship, but most veterans really want jobs, right? And then they can do, they can apply this skill on their off time, right? You can be a weekend warrior rehabbing a couple of houses, but you have a job where you're managing a construction site that may be a 20, $30 million build that you're part of a bigger team. You're going to learn these skills, right? But it's to get more veterans into the industry and build a, a viable pipeline and pathway because, you know, on the on the rebuild the fort side is, yeah, we're we're intentional about community revitalization. We're intentional about sitting down with cities and having these tough conversations, right? Re what, you, what do you really want to do, right? And can we really bring to market a solution? Um, the challenge is, right, you know, communication, right? Can you communicate the value, right? So, you know, the value proposition to veterans, we're all on the line. We know we, we do offer a lot of value to the market, but to, to be able to deliver that value and, and articulate that value, that, that, that is what I'm, I'm learning to do very well. And that's where my focus is on the organization, because, you know, when, when veterans do get the jobs, they execute. And when, when the employers, more employers realize that there, there's a value or a value, valuable partner that's actually giving them quality training, um, you know, they, they they want more of that because everyone's going through a rescale, whether you're a civilian or a veteran, right? It's it's can we get, can we get, can we get it right? And at this point on the rescale uh, approach and, and, and the acceleration of, of the need for rescaling, can we focus on that population, the veteran? Give them a head start in this market. Dude, we are... Uh... Coming up on time, I know you got a hard stop, uh, but man, I, I just really want to uh, encourage you in this effort. I also want to, uh, you know, applaud you in the fact that that your heart is very clear for veterans, uh, that your heart is very clear for your community, for revitalizing, um, just revitalizing in a very meaningful way, not only through policy and some of the awesome stuff that that you're doing at a, at a high level politically. But but really with the heart of it, as you said, at meeting pain points with very actionable, uh, objective, business focused and, and what I believe to be honoring to all parties uh, methodologies. And, and so I think it's awesome, man. I think it's it's extremely creative. It's it's very go getter, very Marine Corps of you. Um, mm -hmm. But but I love the fact that that just the 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 framework that you're using to to meet pain points, but also to do it in a way that. Uh, honors the things that you love and are passionate about it, it shines through and it's 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 incredible man and the education piece like Stu is highlighting and you know the education piece to not only educate but to to pair up with employers and to meet a very very practical need that i think would be a, a pretty high on the list for most vets as they transition 
Um, what am I, ne what's, what's the next mission? What am I going to do? How am I going to pay for, uh, you know, how am I going to support my family? I think those things are so critical and, and, and I just love that you're meeting that need, man. So thank you for that, Andy. Appreciate it, dude. You're doing and, an awesome I job. Think, I think the biggest thing too, and I'll leave it with this is that all, all I've been trying to do and all I'm really doing is I'm trying to minimize the misery index. If you look at the misery index for veterans right now, it's, it's kind of here. Right. And, and, and if I can, bring that index down, right? Like, let us be less miserable. Because, you know, honestly, like, you know, I shouldn't have to bury my friends every year because they're so miserable. When there's so much beauty in the world, so much opportunities, and there's so many problems, right? So America has to do a better job of transitioning the veterans, right? And we hear that year after year. Well, I'm just doing what I know how to do. And I'm doing it with intention. And again, yeah, it's, it's the framework can be mimic like go out and procreate go out and execute um but, but i'm just a true true believer that you know if if the problem for me is that i'm tired of you know the misery index for our community then i'm going to spend my time trying to reducing that but i also got to make sure that i'm moving economically as well and you know the universe has done a very good job of blessing me to to move in line with purpose and again it's, it's just i'm a i'm i'm a i'm in a unique position right now where you know, I've learned a lot because I was curious. I've opened so many doors to your point, Stu, and sat in the rooms and listened, kept my mouth, mouth shut, took notes that I actually have some insights that that can really help people. And these communities are are wanting help. Veterans are desiring purpose. And, you know, the mission is very clear. It's like, let's just take care of our own in our own backyards. And, you know, veterans are coming back and their backyards is really just an education gap but their passion and purpose can align with what we've already done. Awesome, man. You're doing fantastic work. I, uh, it's been really, really fun just to be a little small little piece of it and just watching you. And and every time I come into town, you educate me and you walk, you run me around. It's, it's been super fun, man. I've enjoyed really getting to know you and being your friend. Um, how do people find out about this? Where do we send people? What do we put in the show notes to uh, learn more about Rehab Warrior? Yeah, I would just say check out rehabwarriors.com, go online. Um, apply if you're interested. Um, you can follow us on the Instagram, LinkedIn, Rehab Warriors. Um, we're we're going to do a better job of sharing our story. We've been, you know, Stu knows, I got like this whole library. I'm, I'm horrible at posting. I just hired a social media person because I, I really want to do the hard work. But yeah, just just go to the website. And yeah, it's, it's really, it's the veterans. This is for you guys. I've, I've, I have I've kind of told you this last time. I, I, I put my time in. I'm dropping the chem light. I'm building it. I'm going to build the team. We're having some cool conversations, but I'm having fun right now. I'm really having fun and I'm just inviting other veterans that are interested, you know, to go ahead and, and, you know, just get involved if you can, because it's, it's our country, it's our communities, and we should be the ones that rebuild them. And with jobs being um, really ripped away, um, I just, I really see this as a huge opportunity. Um, I've been saying it for years, but it's just the, the opportunity is getting closer and closer. And I think policy will create some change. But, um, you know, the education is what was missing, and I brought that to market, so it's for them. Love it, man. Guys and gals, we'll uh, put all that in the show notes. Go check it out. Hey, if you're a military veteran, um, this this is a must-see. Um, Andy, thanks, man. This is fun. Thank you.